family in Denver and Jane's family in the Springs. And, and it, it's something that we are willing to do because we want to celebrate the love of Christ with our family, don't we? We're, we're just willing to give our best. We're willing to go all in for Christmas. It's interesting, the Bureau of Transportation, they said that Christmas travels goes up 25% higher than at any other time of the year. And so as we give our best for Christmas, as we cook great meals and we make gobs of cookies and fudge and all that great stuff that makes us look plumpier and happier, we're willing to go all in for Christmas. Christmas is that time of year that just brings it out of us. We, we love the Christmas music. Do you guys love Christmas music? I have Pandora on all of my gadgets, and in Pandora, I'm listening to Bing Crosby Christmas and James Taylor Christmas and Chris Tomlin Christmas, and I've just been listening to it all month. Just, uh, I just get so wrapped up in the whole Christmas uh, spirit because it's really my favorite time of year. I don't know about you. And so we have these great plans for Christmas Eve tomorrow night, and we're excited. This is going to be a great service. Tim Brown and the worship team have done an amazing job for what we're going to have tomorrow night. I, I'm really excited. And afterwards, we're going to watch a deep, insightful Christmas movie that, that just makes you be introspective. It's called Elf. And uh, you know, it's, it's just a wonderful experience of our family just enjoying having this time together. But you know, the, the festivities of Christmas can oftentimes be a distraction for us. That we maybe don't take the time to really consider what the true meaning of Christmas really is. Obviously, it's not about Gangnam style Christmas lights. And so as we look at Christmas, I want us to look at these three wise men that came and, and went through extravagant means to come to the Christ child. And I want us to kind of consider what this says to us. And maybe it will uh, open up our hearts to how God would want us to respond to Jesus today. So with that, let's pray. Lord, as, as we come before you and we look at these three wise men, first of all, we, we see that they traveled great distances and they brought extravagant gifts. And Lord, they, they bowed before you and worshiped you. Lord, I pray that we would do the same thing this Christmas. That we would take the time during the hustle and the bustle and, and all the activity to, to, Lord, come before you. And Lord, that we would offer you extravagant gifts of our hearts. And we pray that you would teach us today what that looks like. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're, we're going back to Matthew 2, verse 1, the same verses we covered last week. We're just going to go through the first 12 verses. If you read with me, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem, in Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that had, they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. 
And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fouled down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So if you look at these three wise men, there, there's not a lot that we know about them, but we can kind of surmise some things in looking at in context of what's happening here. First of all, what we see is, is the wise men could have come up with many excuses not to travel the great distances they did to see this newborn king of the Jews. That many believe that these three wise men were actually from Persia, meaning modern-day Iran. And uh, they, they believe that these wise men historically were very versed in the Old Testament scriptures because while Israel was held in captivity in Babylon, which then became Persia, that in Babylon, the, the teachers of the Jewish scriptures would teach these wise men as they would sit around and discuss this wisdom of the Jews. And so th guys like Daniel, who were in captivity in, in Babylon hundreds of years before this, he could have taught them scriptures like what Numbers 24, 17 says, the teachings of Moses. And he said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheph. So these three wise men, believed to probably be astrologers, uh, versed in the stars, they saw this uncommon star appear, which would be to the west of them, and that they said, that's the star that the Jewish scriptures were talking about, and let's go meet this new king of the Jews. So I looked on the map from Iran to Israel. It's about 1,100 miles. And mind you, they're traveling by camel, right? So I also looked up what is the walking speed of a camel? It's a blistering two and a half miles an hour. So just to go the 1,100 miles, I did the math through my calculator. I figured out it would take a minimum of 440 days for these guys to travel from Iran all the way to Israel. But the, the great desert is in between there, so what is commonly known is that that travelers from the east would actually travel up the Euphrates River Valley in Iraq, go up north, and then come down in through Syria into Israel. So it probably could have taken these guys, they believe, up to two years to travel this great distance. So that is why many believe that when the star appeared, when the baby, Christ the child, was born, the men saw this star, they said, let's go see them. They packed up their camels and all their gear, and they traveled, and maybe up to two years later, they come to Bethlehem to find the Christ child. That's why many believe that Jesus at this time is actually a two-year-old boy. Just some interesting information that needs a drink of water. So with that in mind, can, can you think of the excuses these guys could have used? thinking that, knowing they would have to travel this great distance. I don't know if it was me. I'd be going, dude, that's just too far. I got, I don't even have vacation time for that, much less sick time, right? And we'd be gone from home too long. And you know, there's, dangerous, there's danger out there. There's wild beasts, and there's bandits, and there could be Oakland Raider fans out there. I, I'm not going. So they just don't know what they encounter. But they ignored all the excuses to go see the king of the kings. And I, I'd love to write a book of excuses that I've heard over the years that I've been a pastor 
of why people don't come to church. And so we decided we're going to have a Sunday that is dedicated as No Excuse Sunday. And it's dedicated to missing church attendees. And here's what we're going to put in the paper. To make it possible for everyone to attend church this Sunday, we are going to have a special No Excuse Sunday. Cots will be placed in the foyer for those who say, Sunday is my only day to sleep in. There will be a special section with lounge chairs for those who feel that our pews are too hard. Eye drops will be available for those with tired eyes from watching TV late Saturday night. We will have steel helmets for those who say, the roof would cave in if I ever came into church. Blankets will be furnished for those who think the church is too cold. And fans for those who say it is too hot. Scorecards will be available for those who wish to list the hypocrites present. <laughs> Relatives and friends will be in attendance for those who can't go to church and cook dinner too. We will distribute stamp out stewardship buttons for those who, that feel the church is always asking for money. One section will be devoted to trees and grass for those who like to seek God in nature. Doctors and nurses will be in attendance for those who plan to be sick on Sunday or are hungover. <laughs> the sanctuary will be decorated with both Christmas poinsettias and Easter lilies for those who never have seen the church without them. <laughs> we will provide hearing aids for those who can't hear the preacher and cotton wool for those who think he's too loud. Hope to see you there. It's a humorous thing of looking at the excuses that we can make of why we won't go the extra distance to worship Jesus, isn't it? But attending church isn't the issue I'm addressing here. What, I, what I'm addressing is the issue of the heart. You see, these three wise men, they, they risked their lives to travel great distances to go and see the king of kings, the king of the Jews. Jesus was very important to these three wise men to go see. How important is Jesus to us? Church attendance and serving in the church is just a byproduct. It's, it's not what the focus is. It's a byproduct of our deep love and devotion to Jesus Christ. It's what it should be. And so it's very possible that there may be some in the room today that you are actually here today to find Jesus, and we pray that he reveals himself to you today. But the second thing we see here is the three wise men, they, they honor Jesus by giving their best gifts. There's incredible significance in these gifts. And obviously the three wise men were overwhelmed with joy when they finally came to the home where Jesus, the Son of God, the King of Kings, was, that can you imagine being on such an epic journey that traveling for two years, you finally arrive? I, I will never forget in 1984 when I was much younger and much dumber, I, I rode my bicycle across the country. We started in Anacortes, Washington. And when we got into New Jersey, we were kind of up on a hill and I could see New York City the buildings of New York City, and the joy that we felt that we have arrived after ten and a half weeks. These guys were traveling with stinky camels for two years, and they finally came to the place that the king of the Jews was. And so in response to this, as their hearts were overwhelmed with joy, they broke out these gifts, these expensive lavish gifts to give to the king of the kings. What can we learn from these gifts? First one, we look at gold. Gold is a gift that is given to kings. You don't give a king platinum. You give him gold. Psalm 72, 15 says, Long may he live. May gold of Sheba 
be given to him. Sheba would be in the Arabia area. And so is it possible that these men bought or picked up gold on their travels as they're going through Arabia to bring to Jesus, that they were giving honor to Jesus as the king, the king of the Jews, the king of kings. They gave the child gold because of who he was. And what are we willing to give Jesus today? Are you giving him your best? And then they gave him frankincense. Frankincense is it's described as, as very expensive, glittering, odorless gum obtained from the bark of certain trees. And it's a very expensive process to get this frankincense out. It was often a gift that was given to in response of deity. And it was burned as a sign of their worship as they offered up their prayers to their God. So Isaiah 60, verse 6 says... A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. This is from the east. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. And this is what was happening here. That as they offered frankincense to Jesus, the boy, what they were offering was their offering of worship of him as God who became man. So the wise men could have been embracing the significance of the fulfillment of Scripture here that this was now the coming of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, as the Jews had been proclaiming for hundreds of years and praying for is that this coming Messiah would come, that God would become man and live among them. And this is what they were acknowledging. And do we acknowledge Jesus as God who became man? And do we offer him our best? And the third thing they offer is myrrh. This is a a very valuable spice and a perfume. And, And what it was usually used for was they would use it in the embalming process after a person had died. And we see later in John 19, after Jesus had died on the cross, taken down the cross, and he was being put in the grave. Listen to what happens in John 19, verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. And then Jesus was put into the grave. But he was arisen three days later. So the myrrh is a symbol of, of the mission that Jesus had come to accomplish. That ultimately, God became man. Jesus Christ was the Son of God who came ultimately to die on the cross for our sins. And the myrrh is a symbol of them acknowledging that was the end, that was the mission of this child, and they were giving him honor and praise for that. So the statement that the three wise men were making with these gifts, that they were acknowledging that Jesus was the Son of God. They were acknowledging that God became man to live among them. And they were acknowledging that Jesus came with one supreme purpose. And that was he came to die for the sins of the world. He came so that all men and women can be redeemed back to God through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Now, what redemption means is that something that is lost, a price has to be paid to buy it back. And so the price that was paid to buy us back is the life of Jesus Christ. And so what was lost is relationship that we have with the Father through our rebellion, through our own self-will, of us choosing to live our life without following God and without God in our hearts, 
The result of that is sin, separation from God. Scriptures say all have sinned, and the penalty of sin is death. So the internal destiny of all mankind without Christ is eternal separation from God. And that's why this time of year is so significant that what we are celebrating is not just a nice holiday for families to be together. It's not about buying nice gifts and watching Gangnam style Christmas lights. It's about Jesus. It's about what God did for us. And how we respond to this is critical because God paid the ultimate price of giving his son for the redemption of all mankind back to him for those who have faith in Christ. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us on the cross. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So the ultimate thing we can do in response to what Christ has done for us is to say, Jesus, I receive the gift of your redemption today. To acknowledge the price that Jesus paid for us. To receive it in thankfulness. And then, in response to that, then we offer him these gifts. You see, Jesus was worshipped by these wise men. This is the third point, that they acknowledged who he was as the king of the Jews. And I believe we as followers of Jesus Christ, worship is our highest calling. This is the greatest aim, the greatest goal that we have as, as followers of Jesus is to learn to be worshipers of him. It's bringing Jesus our very best from our hearts. And the wise men got that. They acknowledged the truth of who he was. They went through great distances. They brought expenses, expensive lavish gifts for the Son of God. And when we see who Jesus truly is, what happens is our response should be the very same thing, of giving him our very best. And I want us to understand this. Worship is much more than just singing songs on Sunday morning. Worship is a daily activity. Romans 12 says to offer yourselves as a daily living sacrifice. It's we continually put ourselves up on the altar and say, Lord, I give my life, my heart, my attitude, all my dreams, all my aspirations, all my material things, my time, my energy, I give to you. See, that's what worship really is. And worship means that we are willing to offer him everything. As Colossians 3.23 says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Why does the scripture say that? Because that is our greatest means of worship, is that everything we do, we do for him. Now, I looked up what worship means. The word worship, it means kiss the hand or the ground toward. And so when you see like uh, um, the, in the Middle East of their form of worship as they will turn to the east and they, they kneel down on their knees and they, they bow down and kiss the ground, this is what they're doing, is that they are worshiping their God. Unfortunately, it's the wrong God. But do we do the same thing? How do we worship God? Is it by periodically going to church once or twice a year? Or are we all in? Are we willing to give God our very best because he is worthy, because of what he's done for us? You see, that's when our faith becomes authentic and we become true disciples of Jesus, where we say, God, I give you everything I am, and I do everything for you. You see, the wise men got it. That's why they're called wise. They got it. They were filled with great joy and anticipation. 
And when they found Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, they bowed down and worshiped him. And the great thing that we see here is that the wise men also were obedient to the Father. Because as we read there, that last verse, the, the angel of the Lord came to them and warned them not to go back to Herod. And so they went back through another route and avoided coming before Herod because God wanted, the Father wanted to protect Jesus Christ, the Son of God, from Herod so that he could eventually give his life on the cross for us. This is all part of God's great plan and strategy of how he was bringing redemption into the world. God was involved through this whole thing, and he's been involved through your whole life of bringing you redemption and life in him. And that's why we worship him. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And as we are coming before the Lord, we, we want to avoid being like Herod. We, we want to avoid being like Herod where, where we're just trying to protect our own agenda, where we're trying to protect our own little kingdom. But what these three wise men said was, we'll go great distance We'll risk everything, and we'll bring lavish gifts, gifts to lay before Jesus so that we, too, can bow down and worship him. I think one of the ways that God would call us to be obedient to Jesus is as we give him our best in being his representatives. The scripture says that we are ambassadors of Christ, which means that we represent him. As you go into your workplace, as you go into your neighborhoods, and as you go into your homes, you are Christ's representatives, his ambassadors. And one of the greatest things, the greatest act of worship that we have is that we become as Jesus in the world. In every little circle of influence that we have, we bring Christ into it. Jane and I, uh, we had a little open house in our neighborhood and Jane and the girls just went around and, and handed out cards and just invited people to come and we didn't know who would come but what we wanted to do was just to be Christ's ambassadors in our neighborhoods. You can be Christ's ambassadors by taking the Christmas card and just inviting someone and say, hey, would you like to come to church with us on Christmas Eve? We'll come and pick you up. And the last thing that I want to offer you an invitation to is to consider, you got time to pray about this, but starting on January 1 through February 9th, we're going to do another 40 days of prayer and fasting. And, and what we're going to do in that 40 days is, is we are going to pray about God moving in significant ways through us in 2013. 2013, we have the South Sudan Initiative where we are going to be planting 25 to 30 churches in, uh, in, February, in February and March. We're going to have the uh, sacred parenting seminar that we hope will train and equip parents to be godly parents in our communities. And we have some other great things that are coming up in 2013. We, we are praying for God to move in significant ways through the churches in our valley, so that the kingdom of God can advance. And so we just invite you to consider being a part of that 40 days of prayer and fasting. Some of you saying, are you crazy? I can't fast for 40 days, but maybe you can fast from something for 40 days. I'm going to fast from Christmas cookies. Because <laughs> I eat them all. No, but there is something that you could pray about being a part of in that 40 days of fasting. And starting tomorrow night, we will have sign-ups uh, that you can join. Maybe you would fast one lunch a week, or maybe you would fast one day a week with us. We just invite you to participate with us, because I believe that when a people get serious about giving our best to Christ, that we would come before him in prayer and fasting. I believe the hand of God comes God moves. You know what? There's a lot of work to be done, isn't there? And so let's stand as we close. 
As we close, let's offer Jesus today our very best in worship.